name is Rachel Helbring. I'm from the Tennessee State Museum, and this is week two of our um, class series leading up and talking about women's suffrage. Uh, a few things to go over before we launch right in. Um, we're so glad that you're here this evening, uh, but we would also like to make sure that your microphones are muted. So um, if you go down kind of to the bottom of your screen, you might have to bring your cursor down. You'll see a little microphone pop up. It should be red. That means you're muted. Just double check because sometimes um, your devices will cause interference. So please do that. If you have any tech questions at all, if your audio is messing up or anything like that, um, Joyska Nunez Medina, she's on here. You can chat directly to her and she can kind of help you troubleshoot if you have any audio problems. Um, you can also send any questions to all panelists and we can all see them. Um, at the very end, Dr. Bond is going to answer some questions. So if you want to shoot those over also in the chat bar, get to the chat the same way you find your microphone to kind of scroll down towards the middle of your screen. Um, again, send those to all panelists and we will ask Dr. Bond some of those questions here at the very end. So to kick us off and get us started, we have Dr. Miranda Frank Rhodes. She is the uh, curator who has been developing our ratified exhibit that will open later this year all about the centennial of women's suffrage. So Miranda, take it away. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are so grateful to have with us this evening Dr. Beverly Rubon. She is a professor at the University of Memphis. Dr. Bond's research interests focus on African American women's history, and she has written numerous scholarly publications on that topic. Um, Dr. Bond is, has also co edited a multi volume series of Tennessee Women, Their Lives and Times, which is an excellent resource on Tennessee women's history. Um, recently, Dr. Bond was a featured scholar and National Public Television's Women's Suffrage Documentary by One Vote. And we so appreciate Dr. Bond's work with the Tennessee State Museum. She is a member of our Board of Scholars that has been advising us on all of our Women's Suffrage Exhibit projects. If everyone would please join me in welcoming Dr. Bond. Well, thank you so much for having me as one of your speakers. Um, I am going to just, I, this is, I'm kind of new to all of this, so I'm just going to assume that everything is going okay. Uh, Rachel is getting me set up with my slides. Uh, this particular lecture is not really on, I guess, the suffrage period. It's really on the, the years that are leading up to the suffrage. And I'm going to focus on um, the topic of when war comes to women, the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, because I think that was that was a, a seminal event in the lives of women, uh, particularly African American women. And much of what we will see later in that in the century, in terms of the suffrage movement, is only possible because of what has happened with the Civil War. So let me just kind of um, go into this. I talk a little bit about the roles that women played, um, North, South, Black, White, um, in the Civil War. I'll talk about changes in lifestyles um, as they're transitioning. African-American women are transitioning from slavery to freedom during this period. And then about the expectations of what freedom would mean. Um, suffrage isn't, for, for women isn't, Black women in particular, isn't one of the primary things that you see as the goal coming out of the Civil War. But it will, of course, become a goal as you move into that post-Reconstruction, late 19th century suffrage movement. So and it, let me just go ahead with the lecture then. When we think of war, regardless of time or place, we have traditionally envisioned battles between men. Uh, men engaged in army conflict with women appearing only occasionally. Um, and most likely, if they do appear, they're on the periphery of the battle of the war. War is usually about armed conflict, man to man struggle, conflicts that become badges of masculinity, um, conflicts that very rarely have to do with fighting or struggling 
for femininity, for ideals of, of, of what are the roles of women. Men and boys go off to war and our visions of battlefields as distant sites. While women undoubtedly experienced the deprivations of war on the home front, very few were physically present on the battlefields. Next slide. Next slide. But war did enter the lives of women during the American Civil War. In a few cases, women on both sides of the conflict chose to join the fighting, sometimes disguising them themselves as men and serving until they were wounded, captured, killed, or until they chose their secret. In the American Civil War, these soldiers included uh, women like Frances Clayton, who was who served our, uh, as a soldier under the name of Albert Cashier. Sarah Edmonds, who served as Franklin Thompson, which was an alias she had been using uh, to earn a living even before the Civil War. Um, her, she earned a living as a sales, as selling Bibles, traveling around selling Bibles. But she could only do this um, by assuming this disguise of a man. So she just continued the disguise and became a soldier during the Civil War. Um, she served in the Union Army, both served in the, in the Union Army. And then there's Loretta Velasquez, who served as Lieutenant Harry T. Buford in the Confederate Army. Also, Louisa Hoffman, who enlisted first in the Confederate Army and then later um, served in the Union Army. So she's making that transition from one side to the other, but serving in both armies um, in the disguise or with the disguise of a man. Women used male names. They dressed, dressed as men, binding their breasts, patting their waist, as you can see in the photos of the, in the illustration at the top, and cutting their hair short. They also depended on the fact that military recruiters were anxious to fill quotas um, in the war effort that was a, a war that was literally eating up the ranks on both sides of the conflict. So the military recruiters just didn't ask questions if these women were safe or were um, excellent in their disguises. These cross-dressing soldiers modeled male speech and mannerisms and male behavior. Some like Elizabeth Niles of New Jersey who fought beside her husband, Martin, in the 4th New Jersey Regiment, uh, sorry, infantry, eventually were mustered out as men and may have even collected pensions from the Union Army. Many carried their secrets to their graves and sometimes these graves were on Civil War battlefields. And a few were only discovered to be men, sorry, to be women when they were captured or wounded. Next slide. Now in this slide, you have um, several pictures of women who are serving in the war, but they're actually serving in ways that were that, were, that maintained um, this gendered, socially accepted um, ideas of what a woman should be. So they're not uh, cross-dressing, they're not trying to behave as men. They are essentially still doing what are considered acceptable women, what, uh, female roles. For example, Confederate spy Rose Greenow lived in Washington, D.C. and hosted social gatherings for military and political leaders. Under the cover of these social affairs, Greenow gathered information concerning federal troop movements, supplies, and military strategy. She then dispatched these coded messages to Confederate forces. Greenow was imprisoned in her home in August of 1861, but continued her espionage efforts even while she was under house arrest. She was released in May of 1862 and sent to Richmond where she continued her activities again before eventually traveling on a diplomatic mission to England and France. Greenow died when, um, in a shipwreck in 1864 when she was returning from Europe. Um, the ship wrecked off the coast of Wilmington in North Carolina. Belle Boyd was another Confederate woman who operated as a spy out of her father's hotel in Front Royal, Virginia. In one instance, she provided information to General Stonewall Jackson during his attack on Union troops in Front Royal. Boyd was arrested several times and eventually made her way to England in 1864. She returned to the United States in 1862. 
1866. Pauline Cushman was an actress who scouted Confederate forces and was a Union spy under the command of General William S. Rosecrans. Next slide. Sorry. We could just stay with this slide, but this one's okay. Don't worry. Um, black women, I just want to mention that black women also contributed to the Union espionage efforts. And of course, two of the most famous black women who served as spies were Harriet Tubman, uh, who had escaped from slavery and returned 19 times to help um, others escape, and Mary Jane Richards Denman, who usually was known, um, her activities were known, sorry, her name was revealed in her activities as Mary Bowser. So you may see um, a book by an author, I wrote a name down, but I don't have it with me right now, I'll put it in my sources. But um, the book, is describing her, is naming her as Mary Bowser, but her name was actually Mary Denman. Tubman was a, a, a Union scout, a nurse, and a spy, and she even created her own uh, spy network to infiltrate Confederate bases in South Carolina. Like Tubman, Denman was born into slavery, but she was freed and sent north to be educated. She returned to Richmond just before the Civil War posed as a, a, uh, as a slave, infiltrated the Confederate White House and became, uh, and because she was literate, she gathered information and then passed it on to the Union Army. Some of the other activities of women during this period, one of the most important of these activities was nursing um, the wounded on both sides of the conflict. Um, I think that when we think about nursing during this period, one of the most important things to kind of gather is that these women, men and women who are the doctors and the nurses are actually creating a military, sorry, creating a nursing corps, but creating a United, a government nursing or um, medical facility, because this is something that had not existed before the Civil War. But when you have this massive war effort and you have this the extreme and these uh, very difficult injuries that are the result of this, um, and the huge armies on both sides, there will have to be some kind of health core that is emerging. So for the first time, you see this um, core of doctors and nurses on both sides and hospitals that are de developed on both sides. Women helped organize medical care for soldiers on both sides of the conflict. Black and white, northern and southern women nursed the sick and wounded soldiers in hastily constructed field hospitals or in the wards of more developed hospital facilities in towns and cities. Confederate women organized hospitals for soldiers in Nashville and in Memphis before those cities fell to the Union. In Nashville, the Ladies Tennessee Hospital Association raised money for, su for supplies and staffed the hospitals with nurses. The Southern Mothers of Memphis raised funds to provide assistance, clothing, and nursing for Confederate soldiers. Elizabeth Aiken, who was known as Aunt Lizzie, and Mary Mother Sturges, uh, Mother Mary Sturges joined the 6th Illinois Cavalry as nurses and worked at the Union hospitals in Memphis. Dorothea Dix organized the first nursing service for the Union Army as a whole. Mary Ann Bickerdyke, served as a sanitation commission agent and traveled with the Union Army for four years, assisting in amputations, washing clothing, and treating the sick. And then, of course, the most famous of these nurses is Clara Barton, who organized medical care in Maryland and Virginia, and eventually uh, founded the American Red Cross. We can move on to the next slide. I thought I'd include um, a picture of one of the hospital facilities from Nashville. This is the Hospital for Federal Officers in Nashville in 1864. Next slide. Most of what we assume or most of what we know about women's activities in the war really focuses on what is happening on the home front. So if we look, first of all, on the Confederate side or at Confederate women, Confederate women maintained their households throughout the war as much as possible. Many of them 
kept the farms and the plantations functioning, providing supplies to men, sometimes um, secreting medicines and clothing and shoes uh, that were necessary for the war effort. Sometimes um, hiding these in their dresses or their coats as they passed, as they went into cities, captures, uh, cities that had been captured by the Union, bought supplies and then brought these back to their homes. Um, there are any number of entries and diaries where you, of Confederate women's diaries where you see mention of these kinds of activities. Um, after her husband's death, Adelicia Hayes Franken Acklin managed the family's cotton plantation. And when the Confederate army threatened to burn over 2,000, almost 3,000 bales of her cotton, she transported the cotton to New Orleans, smuggled it out past the Union blockade, and sold the cotton in England for nearly a million dollars in gold. Confederate women sometimes recorded their Civil War experiences in diaries and memoirs, which give us some idea of what's going on on their home front or in the home or with their home front activities. Mary Boykin Chestnut in South Carolina um, kept a diary in which we're able to see what she described or what has been described as, quote, a vivid picture of a society in the throes of its life and death struggle. Chestnut was the wife of a former U.S. Senator who later served as an officer in the Confederate Army. Other Southern women also wrote about their wartime experiences, and these include Lucy Virginia Smith French, Rachel Carter Craighead, and Nanny Haskins of Tennessee. African American women wrote their uh, kept diaries as well. Uh, Susie King Taylor, you see um, in one of the photographs above, was from Georgia, and she composed a diary that described her experiences in a camp, a military camp, one of the military camps, Union Army military camps. In the North, mothers, wives, daughters of Union soldiers faced economic hardships that were very different from what um, Southern uh, women did uh, when their men were drafted or enlisted into military service. Wages were sometimes delayed. And in the case of Black soldiers, some of them were paid less than white soldiers that they served uh, in the un serving in the Union Army. For example, black soldiers in the 54th Massachusetts refused to accept pay until it was equalized. Their female relatives might have appreciated the gesture, but this still meant that they had to struggle to make ends meet. Um, in a society that even before the Civil War um, discriminated against African-American women and men in terms of the occupations or the jobs that they could have. Next slide. The Civil War had a profound and lasting effect on African-American women's lives. And since much of my work focuses on African-American women, um, this is, of course, where I'll try to make some transitions in terms of how these women are moving from slavery to freedom. Enslaved men and women began leaving farms and plantations across the South as soon as the fighting began. Some poured into Southern cities like Memphis, Nashville, Atlanta. Others ex exchanged one rural residence for another. Um, an act of freedom in many cases was just simply moving from a place where you had been enslaved to a place where you could enjoy some level of freedom. The formerly enslaved reach union lines, if that was where they were, if that was one of their goals, they were often put to work building fortifications or working in some of the hospitals um, that were being established, or in some cases, just um, doing the same kind of service things that they may have done in small towns or in rural areas. These workers were considered, quote, contraband of war, with the initial assumption that uh, at the, at the, in the beginning of the war, that they would be returned to the owners, their owners after the Union victory. Um, the term contraband is itself problematic since it continued to reflect the idea that those fleeing the plantations and seeking freedom were still property. Um, contraband is property. Some Union officers um, did in fact return fugitives to their owners. But very early in the war, you begin to see other Union officers who are 
finding roles, finding jobs that the escaping enslaved people could do, things that needed to be done, but not really sure about what would be the union policy um, toward the escaping fugitive slaves. Abolitionists from the very beginning demanded a stronger stand on fugitives and on emancipation. In 1861, Congress passed legislation which provided that any property used with the owner's consent and with his or her knowledge in aiding the rebellion against the United States was to be confiscated. This was one of the first confiscation acts. There was also the suggestion in a second confiscation act that this property, this confiscated human property would be freed. But the union actually, of course, has no official policy at the very beginning for what would be done with these armies of refugees who are coming to their lines, uh, seeking some kind of um, refuge or some kind of security, and hopefully not uh, to be returned to their owners. Special camps were eventually established near Union Army Post. Um, and if you look through, if, of course, around Nashville, around Memphis, um, you, across Tennessee, you can actually see, you, could, you actually had a whole string of these camps, refugee camps that had been established. By 1863, there were over 1,200 Black refugees in three Memphis camps and another 2,500 Black migrants who were scattered throughout the city. By the end of the Civil War, this Black population in the camps, in the shanty towns, in the cities, um, in the city of Memphis and in the city of Nashville and just about every other major city or town in the South had increased in Memphis you actually had by 1865 about 16,000 16, African Americans um, in the city. Now, this was, of course, um, four times the number of Blacks that you'd had in the city before the Civil War. So what you see happening here is that before the Civil War, where you had 4,000 African Americans mostly enslaved, almost an overwhelming number of enslaved, enslaved rather than freed, um, by the end of the Civil War, you've got 16,000, all of whom are freed. So that's going to be a major development in terms of social, economic, and even political changes in the city. Conditions in the, the camps, which I'll just call refugee camps, because, of course, again, con contraband implies property. And these are people who are escaping from that status that they they're trying to get away from that status, even at a time when the Union Army had no clear idea of emancipation or ending slavery. Uh, so these become camps for the refugee, Black refugee population. Conditions in these camps tended to be generally poor. I think um, around Memphis, one of the, uh, in Memphis, West Tennessee and Northern Mississippi, um, probably the camp that is considered the best of these camps was the camp in Corinth, Mississippi, uh, which was almost like a model of camps. But the others, as you see in the photograph, uh, were more likely to be just these tent camp enclosures, hastily constructed cabins sometimes, but um, for the most part, just tent camps. Camps were generally overcrowded and they were disease ridden. Next slide. Going back to what happens to um, women in these contraband camps. Initially, there were more men than women in the camps. And um, of course, the reason for this is that if you looked at the numbers of people who are escaping from slavery, even before the Civil War, the overwhelming majority are men. Um, that continues into the Civil War, but you do begin to see increasing numbers of women who are either escaping on their own or who are escaping with husbands, fathers, and even sons, mothers coming with their sons. So at the very beginning, you have more men, but an increasing number of women. After 1863, when black men are from the camps are drafted and can be drafted into the Union Army or can enlist in the Union Army, 
Many of these camps make a change. They transition from having an overwhelming majority of men to having majorities of women. Um, for example, by the end of the Civil War, about three-fourths of the um, residents of these camps in Memphis were women and children. Of the nearly 16,000 African Americans in Memphis by 1865, about 60% are women, reflecting this increasing number who had been coming in during the Civil War. If we looked at 1863, when you're just beginning to see this population coming into the city, of over 1,200 who are present in the Memphis camps in 1863, about 218 were women. 186 of these women came with children, and there were about 700 children in the camp. So you got a um, little over 900 women and children, a majority of that number in the camps themselves are women and children. Women in the camps found jobs in the city or around the camps as general laborers, um, as hospital aides, as cooks, as laundresses, um, generally working at the Union Fort in the city. Most of these women, once again, were unskilled. Um, most overwhelmingly were illiterate. Um, in the camp itself in 1863, there were only about eight women who could claim a status as, of skill, but they were skilled as seamstresses. Most camp residents, um, again, were illiterate, but Northern missionaries and the Freedmen's Bureau are sending agents to the South and organizing in the camps, organize, organizing schools in the camps. Camps eventually included schools, churches, um, some small businesses, barber shops, these kind of things. However, many of the women and children and some men who were old, too old to be maybe drafted into the military. Many of them were uh, sent to surrounding areas, uh, back into the agricultural sector. For example, on um, President's Island, which is um, in the Mississippi River, adjacent to um, the city of Memphis, um, there were still cotton plantations or a cotton plantation on the island. And the women, some of whom had husbands or fathers, um, serving in the Union Army out of Fort Pickering, were sent to President's Island to pick cotton and to, of course, back into this agricultural sector. Women from the camps also worked as searchers of white women who were going back and forth from the city back to the rural area. Searchers um, who once again, uh, sorry, women who were um, sometimes transporting what we would consider essential goods um, to the Confederate Army in the rural areas. Next slide. Another way in which um, Black women, another place that Black women found jobs um, was in Memphis, was working in what was called the Canfield Orphanage um, for, for Black children. Uh, some of them brought their own children. So this is not necessarily an orphanage. Um, it's not necessarily confined to just children who are without parent, both parents. Um, a woman who might be employed in the uh, orphanage could keep her own children with her. Canfield um, Children's uh, Colored Orphan Asylum was established in 1850, sorry, 1864. During the course of, its, um, of the Canfield work, some of the children who were brought to the orphanage um, were of course sent or were fostered out or apprenticed out to um, white families, sometimes in the rural areas or sometimes in the city. One of the most important thing this, things that's happening um, for African Americans, men and women, during this period is that there is this question of the value of their labor. Um, how are they to be paid? Um, those women who were working in the orphanage, um, of course, brought their children and might be paid in kind in terms of um, having a place to, to live, having um, food for their children. Um, sometimes the women who were working um, nursing black soldiers um, in the city. 
um, men and women who were uh, employed as nurses um, might be considered, might be paid into, might have their wages paid into what was called a common fund, whether they wanted to or not. And these common funds were essentially to be available to all of them. Now, this was happening at a very important period when African Americans are trying to negotiate this transition from being enslaved laborers into a free labor market where their expectations of what would, you know, what would be the value of their labor, they are essentially the same as the expectations of, of whites during this period. Next slide. One of the most important things that is also happening during the period is the, um, the development of African American education. And we can see this happening all across the South. Um, I've, I've given some examples in terms of what's going on in South Carolina where you have Charlotte Forden, who was actually from Pennsylvania, from a free black family in Pennsylvania that where her mother, her, uh, her grandmother, her aunts had all been active in the um, Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, had been founders of that society. Um, she was well-educated and when the war began, she um, came south to the Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina uh, to begin working in a school, um, educating Blacks. Um, Laura Town was a white woman who was also working in the same area, and Mary Peak, um, all in South Carolina. And at one point, Laura Town and Charlotte Forden are both working in an area and in a school that will um, become known as the Penn School. So that whole education process is one that, that Black women are becoming very active in. Black and white women are becoming very active in. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to transition to the post-Civil War period. And what I'd like to just kind of uh, make, I'd like to make this transition by talking about what are some of the goals that African-American men and women had during this period, um, during the Civil War period. What did they think will be how they're constructing ideas of freedom. Uh, when I give, when I talk to my students about reconstruction and I'm teaching a primarily African-American history class, I don't really go into a lot of reconstruction, political reconstruction, where we're looking at the reconstruction acts and we're looking at um, the, all the different political things that are happening on a national level. Um, and I choose to call this period, I look at this period, as one in which you are having a construction of black freedom. And what are the expectations of black freedom on the part of African Americans? Um, I also look at what are the expectations of black freedom on the part of white Southerners and white Northerners, because all of these different groups are focusing on what, what is going to, what is going to happen to these 4 million um, newly emancipated people economically, socially, and how will they factor into the politics of the period, uh, politics of this era, of, this, of, of the nation as a whole. One of the most important things that begins to happen as large numbers of men and black men and women are coming um, into southern cities and towns is the idea of creating legally permanent families. Um, and this is very distinct from what it, you know, what of course had existed in terms of family life um, in enslaved areas. Um, family life existed um, even under slavery. Marriage existed, but in a different way. So what we see happening during and after the Civil War is legal, legalizing marriage, making marriage look a little different, look more permanent. As African Americans were in the South, uh, enslaved people were moving into, um, moving away from plantations and farms where they had been enslaved to areas where they could exercise some degree of freedom in terms of um, women, mothers, daughters, sisters are following, again, black men to these areas. As the men are drafted into the army, the uh, Union Army, uh, the women are left 
sometimes on their own. Marriage was a way for the Union Army to, in a sense, force many of the women who had come to the camps back, uh, sorry, out of the camps, and in some cases back into rural areas. And they did this by simply saying that only the women who had some kind of biological tie, like fathers or um, two fathers or brothers or whatever in a camp could remain there and could get the benefits of the these men's service in the Union Army. Um, so essentially what's happening is that people are legally marrying, and in this case, what you see in this illustration, this is a mass wedding ceremony where you see the bride and the groom, but you also see in the background either people who are there to help celebrate their marriages, or in some cases, um, people there to kind of line up and be the next, next person to get married. So what's, what is this really meaning? It means, first of all, that marriage is a way for the Union military to force Black women out of these camps, to kind of, you know, diminish the number of women who are in the camps who might um, become dependents of the men or become dependents of the military, who would be entitled, for example, to some kind of um, maybe medical service or medical um, help. Another thing is that marriage is a way in which families can gain some kind of legal status for their relationships. So you've got people who have been together for decades who recognize that in this new world that they're coming into, the only way to protect their families is that they have to have a legal, legally binding document. Marriage is also a way, on the other hand, of making Black men responsible for women and children. Uh, sometimes when there is no, you know, there's no financial, um, there's no government way of financially taking care of women and children who are coming out of slavery with nothing um, into a situation in which they may not even be able to get jobs. Uh, many of the women who are coming into these camps um, are women who are ill, um, women at different stages of illness and sickness. Many of the people who are coming from slavery, um, escaping from slavery and coming uh, into the camps um, are not healthy. But what you're doing in terms of marriage is that you're saying, okay, you are now responsible, not the federal gover government, um, nobody else. You as an, a man are responsible for taking care of your family. Now, this has all kind of positive things that are going on here. Um, and one of the things that many people ask is, okay, so why is it that did, did large numbers of black men and women decide that they were going to marry? Well, many of them did, but there were others who were saying, well, you know, I have been married to this person that I'm with right now for 20 years. Um, and we are as married as many people who are rushing out to get a marriage license and get married. So what does marriage mean? Um, and marriage does not necessarily mean a piece of paper. Marriage means that we have been together in a committed relationship. So this is a very complex thing that is happening here um, in which people are saying marriage can, marriage can mean, okay, that our marriages, our families are as protected as the families of, um, of people who had enslaved us as white families. But then on the other hand, marriage means something beyond this. We've been married. We had a minister who married us um, as enslaved people. Next slide. What we also see, and I, I like to move from this idea of marriage to this idea of women's post-emancipation goals. And I think one of the things that you see happening as a post-emancipation goal is that people are trying to live lives that are as far as possible different from what they had experienced under slavery. They want a life and women, and this picture kind of says a lot, the women want lives that in no way resemble what slavery might have looked like. 
Um, in this picture, what we're looking at is this idea of the politics of respectability. And the politics of respectability, as you see it in this picture, are reflected in um, hairstyles, in clothing, um, in just the way in which the people are, people are posed in the photograph. So this politics of respectability reflected in all of those things can also be perceived as just to kind of assume some of what um, white women had had before the Civil War or free black women had had before the Civil War, that you're not treated as a person um, whose labor and whose, even whose body does not belong to them. They have, you know, there's a certain respectability that goes along with this, that you are entitled to basically be treated as a lady. Next slide. Post-emancipation goals also included, um, if we go back to this idea of marriage, protecting family, but it included reestablishing, reconnecting with family. So one of the things that you see is that men and women are seeking relatives that, who have been lost during slavery. And these are really interesting um, efforts to find people. Um, efforts that, again, have a Tennessee connection because these are little ads that were posted in the color Tennessean um, of people who are searching for relatives that they have not seen in sometimes 20 years. If you look at the, um, I think it's the one at the bottom, the person is saying that he hasn't seen his mother since 1844, and it's now probably about 1868. Four years, he hasn't seen his mother but he's trying to give enough information to find his mother that he's been separated from. So this idea of reconnecting, finding, and reestablishing family is very important. Next slide. So what we see happening here is freedom is constructed in terms of family, it's constructed in terms of reestablishing connections, and it's constructed in terms of this ideal of the two parent household. What this also meant, next slide, is that, next slide, is that freedom is constructed in terms of control over labor, um, transitioning from a system where you had no control over um, your labor as an enslaved person to a system where you do have some measure of control over your labor as a, in a free labor system. And in this free labor system, this might also mean that in this two parent household, in this uh, uh, family relationship that is often modeled on family relationships of white men and women, that, that newly freed women's labor was controlled to a sense or was seen to be controlled in a sense um, by their husbands. Now, that's a little problematic as well, because in many cases, um, these women didn't often see their labor in that way. Uh, they saw themselves as controlling their own labor in a way that put them in conflict with um, white employers um, and that might put them in conflict with black men who sought to control labor of the household. Now, what I mean by um, put them, putting them in conflict with um, white employers is that sometimes white employers that, again, they're going through a transition in as well in terms of the meaning of freedom, black freedom. And many women's labor within a household um, <clears throat> essentially was the same labor they had done before the Civil War, but now they're able to determine what this labor is worth. How much should I be earning for the labor that I'm doing in this household? Um, and on the other hand, many employers are saying, um, well, you know, you were doing this labor before you were, you found yourself to be free. So we want you to continue doing this labor and maybe we'll pay you and maybe we don't. Um, the response on the part of many newly freed women was that they used the courts. And at this point in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, they are essentially using what's called the Freedmen's Court. 
um, to bring charges against people who are not paying them for their labor. Next slide. I'm gonna hurry through the rest of this so I have just at least a few minutes for some questions. Um, they are challenging authority through the Freedmen's Courts, um, sometimes very successfully, sometimes not. Um, the majority of, in terms of labor, the majority of enslaved, formerly enslaved men and women will find themselves back in the agricultural sector. Um, and in that agricultural sector, you still have that um, push-pull in terms of the meaning of, this, of labor at this point um, and the meaning of ideals of womanhood during this period. Um, families, Black families, now see themselves and see, they see labor in a context in which they have control over who will work and how will they work and sometimes make decisions that essentially will withdraw women's labor from field work um, because they want to have women, some women, some women within the household who are just working for their household, not working for someone else's household. So this sets up other conflicts. Next slide. And then another aspect of what is happening in the aftermath is the victimization of African-American men and women. Um, and we see this in rural areas um, as well as in urban areas. Um, this is a period when, of course, you have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other, um, what we would call in the modern term, paramilitary organizations or terroristic organizations that are seeking to kind of input, seeking input in terms of what freedom would look like. You also see it in urban areas, in some of the urban conflicts. And of course, um, this Harper's Weekly um, is um, a picture of what's happening in Memphis in 1866 with what we call the Memphis Massacre. Next slide. In all of these things that we see happening, women are, Black women, are in a sense demanding um, autonomy in their relationships. And this demand for autonomy, this new way of seeing their roles within families, within communities, is something that will be reflected in what comes in this next stage of how they're gonna to relate to the suffrage movement, the women's suffrage movement. Um, I think some of the other speakers in this series will talk about that transition during the Civil War and after the Civil War in the suffrage movement and we need to kind of focus on the fact that African-American women will be involved in this because they do see themselves as having roles and having um, authority within their households and within their communities. And they see suffrage or they see the vote in a very different way. Um, so let me just kind of see if I can go on to the next slide. And let's go on to the next one. So um, I don't want to, I want to leave just at least 10 minutes. Next slide. Now, one of the things that- I think that's the last slide, Beverly. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I meant to the, the sources. Okay, great, I'll do that. Um, we're gonna be transitioning because I know that some of you um, would like to know, are there sources available to find out more about these women and about these, you know, what's going on during this period? Um, so I did develop a list of sources that you can use. Um, and the first set on this first page um, include some that are primary source materials, um, like the letters of Laura Town. Um, um, let's see, a little further down, they're probably, the others are probably on the next page, but um, that's a primary source. Um, Laura Ed Edwards is a historian who's written on this, these different transitions that women are experiencing, Black, white, um, Northern, Southern, in this period from slavery to freedom. Susie King Taylor, I mentioned her, um, Charlotte Forden, um, their information. Um, uh, uh Uffelman, who is a historian at Austin P, uh, one of my colleagues on, in Middle Tennessee, has published two books. Um, on two books, uh, two collections of um, on the diaries of Southern women um, during the Civil War period. 
So I'm going to include these. And of course, the last one here is the Federal Writers Project, in which it are, is a collection of slave narratives where you find more information. And then I'm going to do a plug for a recent book on um, by myself and historian Susan O'Donovan um, that focuses on the Memphis Massacre. Um, and then some of the others talk about the violence that women experienced during black women experienced during this period. So let me just stop at this point. I have about 10 minutes left and I'll try to see if I can answer some of your questions. Any questions for me? Questions? Uh, let me look through. I know Miranda was having some audio issues. So let me look through. I know you've got a bunch. I've seen them pop up. I'm seeing them pop up as <laughs> Perfect. Let's see here. That was so great already. Um, Audrey asked, was the cult of womanhood in late 19th century primarily a white phenomenon, or did Black women and men subscribe to that limited view of Black women's roles? Okay, let me see if I can do this very quickly on this, because I think when we think about this cult of true womanhood, it's translated in a different way. It's, it, well, cult of true womanhood is kind of like that northern version of that idea. Southern version is very different. Um, African American women have different versions. So we, when we see there's no uniform ideal of womanhood, and the cult of true womanhood doesn't fit Africa, all African American women. If we looked at Northern free Black women, they might have connections or see connections in the lives that they could live with Southern women, Southern white women. Um, free women or with Northern free women. Um, for example, if you looked at the life of a person like Charlotte Borden and her mothers and her grand, sorry, her mother and her aunts and her grandmother, because they come from a very wealthy, prosperous, free black family, they could fit that model of womanhood. But if you look at a woman like, um, let's see, well, the life of an enslaved woman, her life is not going to fit that. Uh, for example, uh, cult of true womanhood, purity, piety, those are not always seen as virtues or possibilities for enslaved women. When you talk about sexual purity, if you're an enslaved woman, you don't have control over your body. So to say that you're going to exhibit this idea of sexual purity, is it doesn't fit. In the aftermath of the Civil War, the, Part of this may be what you see happening with this politics of respectability, that things are built into that. But again, you have to see it in a geographic context. You know, what is the, what is going on? Um, I think culture, true womanhood is just, it's a way of kind of putting all women in this little bottle, but they don't fit. Um, it's, it's, it's not always realistic. All right, you got two questions about locations in Memphis. Um, that's where were those refugee or contraband camps in Memphis located? Uh, and that one where was, yeah, go ahead. Real quick. Um, there are two that are located right outside the gates or around the gates of what's called Fort Pickering. Fort Pickering was a military Union military installation on the banks of the Mississippi River, kind of overlooking the Mississippi River. And since, you know, when you have large numbers of men who are coming in, um, of course, they're going to be housed in that in near that fort, and then they're going to be um, drafted out, out of the military. So you've got two there, you've got um, one or two more that are in what's called North Memphis, so north of this whole area of Fort Pickering. Uh, you've got the camp down in Corinth, Mississippi, which is very close to, and, and eventually when they close the camp in Corinth, Mississippi, um, those, in, the free people who are in that camp will be pushed into the camps in Memphis. You've got a camp on um, President's Island. Um, so they're going to be around this area. And of course, the goal is that you're not going to be in that camp forever. You're going to transition into the city of Memphis. And when you get into the, when you transition from the camp, um, many people will move into areas around the camp, but in what's called South Memphis, that South Memphis neighborhood. So if you're reading um, either our book on remembering the Memphis massacre 
or Dr. Ash's book on the Memphis Massacre. Um, they'll describe what's happening, the events, and they'll talk about this African Americans living in this South Memphis area. So, and the other one? Yes, they ask where the Canefield Orphanage is located. That's going to be near, well, it's all going to be in that area around there. Um, I have to go back and look at my records to see what the street names are, but in that same, in the same general area. Wonderful. Um, we got a lot of questions about were the refugee camps in the South protected by Union troops and what happened kind of as, as those camps, camps dissipated, what happened to those people? They go into the cities. Um, the same would be true in terms of Nashville or in terms of any of those camps that are, you know, either the people are going to move into areas uh, shanty town areas or find housing in the cities that are nearby, or they may be going back to the agricultural areas. Because um, what you have essentially is the realization you have a surplus of farm labor of African Americans who are coming into the cities at a time when the their labor is in great demand in the, the rural areas. So you very often find um, city governments that are trying to push um, African Americans out of the cities and back to the countryside. Uh, so you've got people who will stay if they can figure out how to negotiate those labor conditions. I mean, you've got to got to find a job, got to find something that you can do. And if you've been a field hand all your life, you know, there's only so much that labor that you can find so many jobs as laborers in an urban setting. So it's a critical transition period. Absolutely. Uh, last question, and it's a big one. Uh, do you think the activist work of black and white women in support of suffrage helped lay the groundwork for the civil rights movement later in the 20th century? That's a huge jump in time. Okay, the activist work of the women in the suffrage movement that we see during this period is going to take 50 years from those from the if we say uh, from the 1870 15th amendment you've got another 50 years before you get to the women's suffrage amendment and then once you get to the women's suffrage once you get let's say to the 15th amendment okay you've got that granting all eventually or assuming all men the right to vote it takes 20 years to disenfranchise african american men then you have the enfranchisement of all women, but you also have the disenfranchisement of black women. So it's going to take another 30 or 40 years to push for the suffrage movement. And there will be consistent activism all the way through. Whether you're looking at the, in urban areas, you're looking at things like the, the Lincoln League in Memphis uh, with Robert Church and his mother and his sisters and his wife as members of early members of the Memphis NAACP, you see this happening all across the South. So that there is that consistent activism, Ida B. Wells and the anti-lynching movement. Um, I think in Nashville, you have that same core of activists, people who are fighting against segregation, uh, streetcar segregation, railroad segregation, all of these different areas and there is no period when there is not this activism. There's a period when maybe the activism is not as open as people would like to have it, but it is there. I think the thing is that people have to look for it um, because I think we have this view of Southern history that is not quite as complex as what it should be. Um, for example, the question on the cult of true womanhood, you could say, oh yeah, everybody, all these women are striving for the cult of true womanhood. Well, cult of true womanhood means different things in terms of black women, white women, Northern women, Southern women, um, immigrant women in different from different immigrant groups, um, Asian, Chinese women, Japanese women. It means so many different things during all these different periods. So our, the way in which we look at women's suffrage, the way in which we look at activism, it has to really be very nuanced and very, very complex. We have to look for these complexities of, of life. 
Okay, hope I got that one. That was a great answer. Thank you. Uh, we will wrap up. We got a couple of questions about if this is being recorded. It is, and it'll go on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow, Monday, um, for sure. So if you want to rewatch it, if you want to see all of Dr. Bond's sources that she provided, um, you can watch the video, you can pause the video there. Um, and somebody asked if we have books about this in our museum store. We sure do. You know, the museum is not open, but when we reopen, um, definitely come and check it out because they've built up a really good variety of books all about women's suffrage and, and activism. So thank you so much, Dr. Bond. That was so wonderful. Thank, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Sorry, thank I you. was kind of rushed through it. But... No, you did great. And uh, thank you to Joyka and Miranda. So we will be back next week. Um, you do have to sign up separately to get the link for that class. So please go on our website and find that link. Um, we're going to have Dr. Mary Evans from MTSU, and she's talking about civil activism um, of Tennessee women before suffrage. Um, so kind of more on the same topic. We look forward to seeing everybody there. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. Do I just click the X? Yeah, just X out whenever you're ready. You got a lot of thank yous. All righty.